I don't know. And again, that's just the, the situation concerning the Trinity. We accept it. it. It is so, whether we can explain it or understand it or not. And of course, skeptics will come along and they'll say, well, I'm not going to believe anything that I don't understand. Well, that's not true. Because uh, if I was to walk in this room and the lights were not on and I flipped a switch and the lights came on, I don't understand, some of you people do, but I don't understand how I can flip a switch and the lights come on. And though I don't understand it, I'm not going to live my life stumbling around in the dark. Amen. And so we, we believe a lot of things that we don't understand, uh, but we just know that it is so. So I want you to know from the beginning that I am not trying to teach and preach or portray whatsoever that we serve three gods. We do not. We have one God in three persons. However that is, we know that that is a biblical fact in the Word of God. Now, Jesus says in introducing this Spirit of God unto the disciples, Comforter, and by the way, there's about 20 different names of the Spirit of God in the Bible, and every different name tells us something different about his person or about his work, and it really is a fascinating study. But he said in verse number 17, um, actually verse number 16, I'm going to give you another comforter. Just as Jesus says, just as I have been with you, just as I have been present with you, there is one that is coming after my departure that is just as much God as I am God, that is just as much a person as I am a person, and so forth. The name comforter is found four times in the Bible, all four times in the Gospel of John. But then in verse number 17, Jesus says something I find a bit interesting to the disciples, to believers. At the end of verse 17, he says, But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be future tense in you. At the time of John 14, the Spirit of God is just with believers, but there is coming a time out yonder in the future that the Spirit of God was going to be in believers. We do know that in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We do know that 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So sometime from John 14 up until Romans 8, 9 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Spirit of God is no longer just with believers but now in believers. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about something like that, I think in my mind, well then, at what point in the Bible, at what point in the Word of God is the Spirit of God no longer just with believers but begins to be in believers and indwell believers. We, and, and of course, there's two popular schools of thought. Maybe one of the most popular schools of thought is Acts chapter number 2, the day of Pentecost. A lot of people believe that that was the time that, that uh, children of God were indwelt for the very first time. The second school of thought that is not uh, so, so widely taught would be John chapter number 20. I referred to it this morning when the glorified Christ showed up to the apostles and he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So either John chapter number 20 or Acts chapter number 2. And, and you say, Okay, Brother Hart, which one is it? It is whatever your pastor teaches you. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's not my responsibility. It's not my job as a guest speaker to come in, guest preacher to come in and rearrange whatever your pastor has taught you about that or anything else. Uh, it really doesn't matter because in our day, it's worthy of consideration, but we do know that in our day when a sinner gets saved, the Spirit of God comes to indwell them and live inside of them in our day, regardless of whenever it began. So we learn, and I remind us, that the Spirit of God indwells the believer. In fact, that's Bible evidence of salvation because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. So we're reminded uh, this evening that the spirit of God indwells the believer. Turn to your right and go to John chapter number 16. And may we just remind ourselves of a few things and then get to something a little bit more practical here in just, just a moment. John 16 and verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, Jesus said, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him, there it is again, not it, that, or a thing, but a person, 
I will send him unto you, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That word reprove means to convince. That word reprove is where we get our word convict or conviction from. You've been around church any length of time whatsoever. You've heard of people testify that before they got saved, they were under conviction. You heard people say that after they were saved, they did something and God convicted them about that. That is the work of the Holy Ghost of God. Now, don't, don't try to accuse your pastor of taking the place of the Holy Spirit. Well, our pastor, he tries to convict people and, and, and so, well, now wait a minute now. The Bible does say in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove. And so it is the reprove, rebu rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Say that three times real fast. But anyway, uh, so we know that from the word of God that the preacher is supposed to preach convincing, convicting messages but ultimately it's the spirit of god that uses the word of god to bring conviction in individuals lives and it's amazing to me i'm not preaching on it tonight how that people say well you know the lord just hasn't convicted me of that well i want to know how come because he's convicted other people of that. How come he's not convicting you of that? And so uh, if there's no conviction, then there's no Holy Ghost. If there's no Holy Ghost, there's no salvation. So, but moving right along, he indwells the believer. He brings conviction here in John chapter number 16. Look at verse number 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. It's the Holy Spirit of God that guides and directs the believer. In fact, that leadership and guidance and direction of the Spirit of God in a, in a person's life, again, is Bible evidence of salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse number 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I'm making a decision, I, I try to reason things out. Uh, I made a decision yesterday about coming to Superior. My wife's home taking care of her dad. Should I go back and, uh, and be with her and help her? Should I go ahead and come to Superior? You know, I'm trying to reason all this out. And the truth of the matter is, as a blood-bought child of God, I don't have to reason, reason anything out. There is one that lives inside of me, the Spirit of the living God, that he is the one that will guide me, direct me in a plain path and show me exactly what I'm supposed to do. Amen. So here I is, amen. Nonetheless, he guides and directs the believer. Well, but Brother Hart, you didn't read the rest of the verse. You better, you better notice the rest of verse number 13. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things that come. Look at there, Brother Hart. He'll not speak of himself. We're, 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 we're not supposed to make a big deal out of the Holy Ghost. He, he don't even speak of himself, and so we're not supposed to make a big deal out of him. Well, now, wait a minute. Turn to your left and go to John chapter number 12. And in John chapter number 12, we find the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. And in John 12, towards the end of the chapter, look at verse number 49. John 12, 49, for I have not spoken of myself. Hmm, that sounds familiar. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And if you'll notice that verse over there in John 16, 13, it does not say that the Spirit of God will not speak about himself. It says the same thing that Jesus said here. He'll not speak of himself. And what Jesus and the, the things that Jesus and the Spirit of God say originates with the Father. And that's exactly what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the Spirit of God. So go ahead and breathe. It's okay for us to study about the Spirit of God tonight. Amen. He guides and directs the believer. Look at John chapter number 15 real quick. Just right close by here, again, towards the end of the chapter. Look at verse number 26. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Well, so the Spirit of God testifies of Jesus. Well, Brother Hart, I thought we were supposed to testify of Jesus and, and witness and go soul winning. Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and in verse number 9 that we are co-laborers together with God. And so it's very comforting to know that as we talk to people about their soul and tell them about Jesus, that there is one ever present with us, the Spirit of the living God that is 
we are speaking on the outside, he is speaking on the inside and testifying of the saving grace of God. Go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. We're getting farther in the back of the New Testament. Hopefully, that's where we're getting closer to the end. Well, don't hold your breath. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Now, in the opening seven chapters of the book of Romans, the Spirit of God has been mentioned one time. In Romans chapter number 8, the Spirit of God is referred to 19 times in one chapter. So just as we could label John 14 as the troubled heart chapter, we could label Romans chapter number 8 the Spirit-filled chapter because it's just full of references to the Spirit of God. I'm going to go to notice one, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And infirmity is a weakness. What kind of a weakness do we have? He tells us. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The will of God is the ministry of the Spirit of God to guide and direct the believer to pray according to the will of God. In the book of Jude, if I was to have you to turn to the book of Jude, and by the way, you could pick whatever chapter you want. It don't matter. It's all good. But in the book of of Jude, it says, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. If we went to Ephesians chapter number 6 and found that passage of Scripture where it talked about the armor of God, shield of faith, sword of the Spirit, and so forth, as soon as the armor gets done in Ephesians chapter number 6, it says, praying in the Spirit. So what is this business in the Bible of praying in the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit? Well, from studying the Word of God, we know from Scripture what it is not. We know it is not warbling in some unknown tongue. But we have still not answered what it is. What it is is what we just read here in Romans 8, 26, and 27. It's looking to the leadership of the Spirit of God to make sure we're praying according to the will of God. If you've been saved any length of time whatsoever, you have, you have had to confess, Lord, I don't even know how to pray about this. Lord, I, I, I just don't even know how to pray about this. Well, it's in times like that that there is one that is ever present with us, the Spirit of the living God that we can look to and we can ask, how should I pray about this according to the will of God? Because 1 John 5 says this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hear us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we have the petitions that we desired of him just as long as we know it's the will of God. We know it's the will of God by the scriptures but 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 what about if the scriptures are silent about something we're praying over there is one ever present with us the spirit of the living God that will guide us and direct us and teach us and show us how to properly pray according to the will of God that's the work of the spirit of God turn back to your left and go to Acts chapter number one in Acts chapter number one there's a famous verse but in Acts chapter number one in this famous verse most of the time, Bible teachers and preachers uh, only emphasize part of the verse. And so I want to emphasize the other part of the verse. Acts chapter number 1, and of course the famous verse in Acts chapter number 1 would be verse number 8. Verse number 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. And this is usually the portion that is emphasized. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both. That means at the same time, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. I want, I want to major on the first part of the verse. But ye uh, shall receive power power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you it is the work of the Spirit of God to empower the believer not only to witness but to live a successful Christian life for the glory of God Oh, yeah, I like this since we're in the book of Acts. I like it over here in chapter number 4. Look at chapter number 4, if you would, please, in verse number 31. I really like this. It says in Acts 4, 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. I, I, I somehow, early in my Christian life, I just got it settled in my brain and in my heart that, mighty dear friend, the only way the work of God 
God is successfully going to get done is by the power of God and the power of God is in a person and that person's name is the Holy Spirit and prayer appropriates that power to work for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. It's the Spirit of God that empowers not just the pastor, not just the Sunday school teacher, but that's for all believers. So in light of, but ye shall receive power and speaking the word of God with boldness. Now there's another famous verse in the Bible, so we just as well go ahead and look at it that has to do with this business of the spirit of God and the power of God and so forth. And of course, that would be Ephesians chapter number five. So let's go there and we'll just, we'll just land there for a while. Go to Ephesians chapter number five and let's look at the, let's look at the famous verse. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I had a lady tell me in the first church that I pastored. Uh, pastored. She said, Brother Hart, do you know how I remember the order of books? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I said, no, how? She said, General Electric Power Company, G-E-P-C. And I'm thinking, if I've got to remember General Electric Power Company to remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, I think I'll just remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. But however you remember, we're in Ephesians chapter number five. And so the famous verse, of course, with the Spirit of God and the power of God would be verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. How unusual it is, and you've heard this before, that being intoxicated on the devil's brew would be associated with the fullness and the filling of the Spirit of God in the same verse. And of course, we recognize that when an individual is intoxicated on the devil's brew that they are under the control of another. And when a blood-bought child of God is emptied of themselves and their sin and the slop of the world and filled with the sweet spirit of the living God, likewise, they are under the control of another. It's just a matter of who we've yielded ourselves to to control us. And so he mentions the filling and the fullness of the Spirit of God in verse number 18. Now, we do know that our God is a God of order. Let all things be done decently and in order. In fact, the very first chapter in the Bible, Creation Week, it's very obvious that our God is a God of order. And so I'm going to, I am about to make, and your pastor and his wife will know that this usually don't happen from me, but I am just about to make a profound statement. I said that one time, Brother Terry, when I was uh, uh, teaching along this line, and I said, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of profound statements, and I saw a lady in the congregation reach into her purse and get a pen and get a pad of paper, and when I made my profound statement, she just shook her head no and put it all away. My first profound statement that I'd like to make tonight is Ephesians 5.19 comes after Ephesians 5.18. Isn't that profound? That's deep, man. I amaze myself. Amen. Look at verse number 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and notice this, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Please notice that word spiritual. If I was to ask this congregation, or most congregations, let me put it that way, most congregations, describe for me, define for me a spiritual individual. Much of the time, people would respond to that, and they would say that a spiritual individual is a person that reads their Bible every day, and they pray, and they're faithful to church, and they witness, and they, and they live a clean life, and they don't go to the movies, and they don't smoke, and they don't drink, and they don't do this, and they don't do that, and you would be 100% wrong because the root word of the word spiritual is spirit. And a spiritual individual is an individual that has gone by verse number 18 and got emptied of himself and filled with the Spirit of God because the spirit, the root word of spiritual is spirit. But here's what we've done. We have met some spiritual people in our life and we have said, I want to be like them. So we observe their life. 
And so we learn by watching their life. They read their Bible every day. They prayed every day and they're faithful to church and they witnessed for Jesus and they lived a clean life and they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And, they did. and so we thought because they were spiritual, if we would imitate their life, that would make us spiritual. But ladies and gentlemen, do's and don'ts do not make us spiritual. The only way you and I can be spiritual is by the enabling of the Spirit of God. Amen. Oh, but by the way, spiritual people... They do read their Bible every day. They do pray every day. They are faithful to church. They do witness for Jesus. They don't go to the movies. They don't do this and they don't do that. That's not what makes them spiritual. That's the result of them being spiritual. And so we have in verse number 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this. I have a son who's very good musically. I have a son that, and my son and I have talked about this. I'm not saying anything behind his back. I have a son that got involved in the Southern Gospel music industry many years ago, not anymore. And um, I, I like some of the Southern Gospel songs if they're done properly, but the Southern Gospel industry is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. Because if they're not singing, they don't go to church. Well, that went over real good. So, so my son got involved in that. Oh, yeah, he said. Okay, so he traveled with him for years and traveled in the bus with him throughout America. My son, and I told him, I appreciate his accomplishments. He has played the piano on main stage of the National Quartet Convention more than once. And I told him, I said, man, I, you know, I'm not big into the industry, but I said, not everybody can say that. I said, I appreciate your accomplishments in what you've done. But I mean, they, they would have uh, venues on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And those bums would sleep in the bus Sunday morning and they would have another venue Sunday night and then they would drive all night and get home. My son, every, every Sunday morning, would have to call, um, have to call a Baptist church in the area to get a ride to go to church Sunday morning when they were not singing and he would often go to church and come back and those guys weren't even out of bed yet. Now, I don't, I'm not going to spend my life running down the southern gospel industry. I'm just trying to get somewhere. When my son first started in that, oh, all the glitz and the glamour and the, and the applause. and Oh, yeah, Dad. He'd call me back, Dad. He'd say, man, we got eight standing ovations tonight. I said, yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Whoopee. I said, and, 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 and he and I, could talk this way without it being a demeaning conversation. I said, son, when you have talent, there's a difference between talent and the touch of God. I said, when you have talent, you get standing ovations. But when you have the touch of God, people get up and come to the altar. Now, I believe you can have talent and the touch of God. In fact, if you're going to get up and sing... I highly recommend, in church, I highly recommend you got some talent. Because I'm going to preach after you get done. And if you've messed up the service, that's going to make it a whole lot harder on me. Amen. Singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Since the root word of spiritual is spirit and our God is a God of order. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't sing spiritual songs in verse number 19 with any heavenly effectiveness, with any touch of God on your life without first going by verse number 18 and asking for the help of the Spirit of God. Profound statement number two. Verse number 20 comes after verse number 18. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a parallel verse, a sister verse in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now when I'm in trouble, I can be thankful for the saving grace of God. When I'm in a hard time, I can thank God for my precious wife and family. 
When I'm in, but he doesn't say in verse number 20, in everything. He said in verse number 20, giving thanks always for all things. It's one thing for me to be thankful when I'm in trouble, and it's another thing for me to be thankful for the trouble. It's one thing for me to be thankful in a hard time, and it's another thing for me to be thankful for the hard time. And we can fake it on the outside for a while, but God knows our heart. And the truth of the matter is, my dear friend, a child of God cannot honestly get to the place where they're honestly thankful for the good things and the bad thing, for all things in verse number 20 without first going by verse number 18 and getting the help of the Holy Ghost to go. Then in verse number 21, now we know a little bit later on in the chapter, he's going to deal with some family members. I have heard Bible preachers say that verse number 21 is talking about the family. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. But ladies and gentlemen, in context, he's not made any reference to the family yet. So verse number 21 is not talking about the family. Verse number 21 is talking about those that comprise and make up the church at Ephesus. He's talking about church members. Submitting yourselves one to another. And what the Bible is trying to teach us, ladies and gentlemen, is you and I cannot even be a good church member in verse number 21 without first getting the help of the Spirit of God in verse number 18. We need His help to pray according to the will of God if we ever asked Him for it. We need His help to be thankful not just for the good things but also the bad things. Have we ever asked Him to help us for that? We need the help of the Spirit of God. That name comforter means it doesn't mean to give comfort. That name comforter means one called alongside to help. And we need his help to be, live a, 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 a spiritual Christian life. We need his help just to be a good church member. But have we ever looked to him and relied upon him and asked him for that? We go a little farther in the chapter. Ladies first, verse 22. He says in verse number 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That teaches me, ladies, that you can't be the wife that God wants you to be in verse number 22 without first going by verse number 18 and getting the help of the Holy Ghost of God. Well, now, Brother Hart, you don't know what kind of a husband I had. You picked him. <laughs> and I'm not picking on the ladies, verse 25, husbands. Love your wives, even if Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Did not Jesus love us when we were very unlovely? And it's real easy for us husbands to love our wives when they are lovely. But sometimes. And my wife is over 500 miles away from here as I talk about this. But we're supposed to love them like Jesus loved us. And we're supposed to love them even if, let me put it that way, even if there are just maybe happens to be times that wives would be unloving. Verse number 25 is teaching, I, I, can, I cannot be the husband that God, not Dr. Stumpsucker, God wants me to be. I cannot be the husband that my wife needs without the help of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't know what kind of a home or a background you came from. It doesn't matter. I, I didn't have a good example. I'm not crying. I'm, I'm not crying around. I'm just simply saying. I'm stating a fact. I didn't have a good husband. A good husband. I didn't have a good example of being a husband. My, my mom and dad split up when I was in the fifth grade. I didn't have the male figure in, in my life for the majority of my life. I, 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 don't, I don't know how a husband's supposed to act and supposed to live. And thankfully the Lord put men of God in my life to teach me the word of God. But the truth of the matter is whether I had an example or not, I need the enabling of the Spirit of God to be the kind of husband that God Almighty wants me to be. Maybe that's the reason why some homes are such a mess is because we're trying to do it ourselves instead of looking and yielding and asking for the help of the Holy Ghost of God. Chapter 6, verse number 1 comes after chapter 5, verse 18. And right now, my little rebel son that travels with me, 
is going to do something he does every time this verse. There he goes. Every time this verse comes up, the very first verse that every wise Christian parents teach their children to memorize. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That little rebel. Children, there he goes. And that teaches me that young people cannot be the young people in the home that God wants them to be in chapter 6, verse 1, without the help of the Spirit of God. Well, Brother Hart, are you saying that children can be filled with the Spirit? Well, where does it say in the Bible that a person's got to be 21 years old before they can be filled? Where does it say in the Bible that they, they, they've got to be 18 or 16? Truth of the matter is, best I can tell in the Bible, as long as they're saved and the Spirit of God indwells them, they are a candidate for the filling in the fullness of the Spirit of God. And they can look to Him and ask Him uh, for help to be the young people in the home that God would have them to be. Then we get, of course, to verse number 4, Angie Fathers. Now, see, in verse number 1, as you know, it's children obey your parents. That's mom and dad. And then in verse number 4, and ye fathers. Now, mom's not mentioned. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's daddy's responsibility to see to it that the children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, now, Brother Hart, if it's my responsibility as a father to do that, how am I going to do that? Because I'm supposed to also go off to work and provide for my family. Well, all right, while you go off to work, you teach wifey, here's how we're going to train our kids, and here's how we're going to bring up our kids, and if you've got any problems during the day, here's how we're going to discipline our kids, and you take care of it while I am away. But it's ultimately daddy's responsibility to see to it that the kids... Um, are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, Mama, when you're at home with the kids and Daddy's off to work the, 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 and the kids act up, and by the way, they're going to act up, don't you run around all day and say, you just wait till your dad gets home. You just wait till your dad gets home. You just wait till your dad gets home. Then Dad comes home from work. He's tired and he's wore out. But before he can sit in his recliner with a glass of tea, he's got to whoop everybody in the house. No, daddy tells mama, here's how we're going to train our kids. Here's how we're going to discipline our kids. If there's any issues during the day, you take care of it. But my dear friend, in verse number four, it's ultimately daddy's responsibility. With responsibility comes accountability. It's daddy's responsibility to see to it and that the children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That teaches me that us parents, us daddies, us parents cannot be the parents that God wants us to be without first going by chapter five, verse number 18. You can't get to chapter 6, verse number 4 without first going by chapter 5, verse number 18. Getting the help of the Spirit of God. Verse number 5 of chapter 6, And servants be obedient to them, they're your masters. There's the application of the employee. Verse number 9, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening. There's the application of the employer or the supervisor or the boss down on the job. We, we, can't, even be, we can't even be good employees. We can't even be good supervisors and employers and bosses down on the job as a blood-bought child of God without the help of the Spirit of God. I wish in some way... It would impress upon us afresh and anew tonight that we need his help in our life more than we realize. All of these things, the Spirit of God, leadership, guidance, helping us pray right, be members in the home, be church members, all of these things the Spirit of God longs and desires to help us with. But have we ever relied upon him? Have we ever looked to him? Have we ever asked him for his help? So what would you do if you blessed someone and they never even talked to you? What would you do if you helped someone over and over and over again and they acted as if you weren't even there? Um when I pastored in South Central Illinois, your pastor and family has been there many years ago. I had a man in the church there that sometimes he liked me, but most of the time he didn't. But he was always there. I knew that he liked me because when he liked me, he called me preach. He'd come into church, 
I'd call him a name. Hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, preach, doing pretty good. I'm like, okay, everything's fine. But there was numerous times. There was numerous times I would get done preaching to that congregation, the whole congregation, not just him. He was in the congregation. Numerous times after the service was over and I'd get done preaching that, that, that I'd be maybe out in the foyer and shaking hands and wishing people to have a good week. I'd stick my hand out to this guy and he'd go... And just walk on by after giving me the cold shoulder. Oh, it upset me so bad. I had to go home and take a half a baby aspirin just to get some sleep that night. <laughs> He'd come back to church the next day. Hey, brother, how you doing? Wouldn't say a word. After about a week or two, hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, preach, you're doing pretty good. I'm like, okay. He got over it. Whatever it was, he got over it. We know that the Spirit of God will never leave us nor forsake us. But oftentimes we live our lives as if he's not even there. Oftentimes he longs and desires to help us with areas of our life. And just like that church member, we throw the Spirit of God a cold shoulder. The Spirit of God is not a force or an influence. He's a person. Your pastor is a person. If I sinned against your pastor, wouldn't the right thing for me to do would be to go to your pastor as a person and get right with him and ask him to forgive me? Of course it would. And likewise, if we have sinned against the person of the Holy Ghost of God, neglected him, not looked to him, not relied upon him, don't you suppose the right thing to do would be to go to him and get right with him and ask for his forgiveness. I was preaching along this line in the state of Kentucky some time back. When I got done, the host pastor got up and said, Brother Hart, go out into the foyer. We're going to dismiss the people. And I said, okay. So I went out there and they dismissed in prayer and people started coming out. And there was a lady that came out and stood in front of me and she looked up at me and I looked down at her. When I pastored, my people honestly looked up to me. Amen. And she said, Brother Hart, you know what I'm going to do? And I'm I'm confessing right now. Your pastor introduced to me many years ago a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's called Culver's. (laughs) We didn't have them down yonder. Your pastor introduced me to Culver's. They're slowly making their way south. When I pastored in the panhandle of Florida, the nearest Culver's was in south side of Nashville, Tennessee, five and a half hours away, and that wasn't too far. (laughs) So in this town where I'm preaching in Kentucky, they had a Culver's. And we was talking about Culver's. And you know how this Baptist life works. I mean, we pray, we preach, and we eat. It's a wonderful life. (laughs) So this gal comes and stands in front of me, and she said, Brother Hart, you know what I'm going to do right now? I'm confessing. I was just certain she was going to say, I'm going to Culver's because church was over. I said, no, sis, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to go home and get right with the Holy Ghost. I said, yeah. That'd probably be a good idea. (laughs) Her mind wasn't where my mind was. But she had it right. We don't rely upon him. We don't look to him. We don't ask him for any help whatsoever. And we just plunge in headlong and try and work it out ourselves. When all the while, there is one ever present with us. I've learned about the Spirit of God that he's a very sensitive person. You're not going to be walking down the street and he knocked you down on the sidewalk and said, Hey, when are you going to start relying on me and looking to me and asking me to help you? No. He'll just let us go on our way, make a mess of it, till we finally crash and burn and say, Dear God, I need your help. And he'll say something like, I've been waiting for this for a while. God help us to recognize that there is one ever present with us. I'm not not trying to preach three gods. I don't know how it all works. But I know this. 
The primary and operative person of the Godhead in our day is the spirit of the living God, and he longs and desires to help us in every area of our life if we'll just look to him and ask him for help. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, I bow before you in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, we would recognize the importance of being right with you, being right with the Spirit of God. Dear God, forgive us for neglecting him. Forgive us for ignoring him. Forgive us for taking things into our own hands and never relying upon him. And as a result of that, Lord, may each of us individually do business. And Lord, as need be, get right with the person that's ever present with us. Never leave us nor forsake us. Merciful and gracious. Longs and desires to help us. Just to be a good Christian. God help us. To recognize the importance of looking to and relying upon the spirit of the living God. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Ladies play. Here's these altars tonight. However the spirit.